So hello to all the listeners out there. Welcome to our Horde Steryman monthly webinar series. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Horde Steryman magazine. I'm honored to be hosting this webinar, which will be focusing on managing dairy cattle successfully in a robotic milking system. The use of automated or robotic milking creates several opportunities for herds in respect to cow health, production, and welfare. Challenges may also exist, but these can often be mitigated through housing design, cow health, and nutritional management. Our sponsor for today's webinar is Galaxy, and we thank them for their support of this program. If you're listening to the presentation live, um, feel free to access the handouts, which you can find in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. This is a copy of most of the slides from today's presentation, along with some information about our sponsor, um, which is Galaxy. Um, also, if you have any questions that come up while our presenter is speaking, feel free to type those into the question section of that control panel, and we'll answer them following the presentation. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Trevor DeVries. Dr. DeVries is a professor and Canada Research Chair in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph, where he has been a faculty member since 2007. In his position, Trevor leads a highly productive research program focused on dairy cattle nutrition, management, behavior, and welfare. Trevor works diligently in extending that research to the field along with teaching at the university and serving on many local, national, and international professional committees. Dr. DeVries, welcome to the webinar, and I look forward to hearing your presentation titled, Managing for Success with Robotic Milking Systems. Great, and thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the invite to be here. Uh, thank you to the sponsor also for um, sponsoring today's uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking about this topic area of managing for success with robotic milking systems. It's an area that we've been working in uh, quite extensively over the past number of years, uh, largely driven by the fact that we've seen a large proliferation in the adoption of robotic milking technology, uh, not only here in Canada where I am, but we see it in the US and, and we're seeing that uh, worldwide. Now, uh, obviously with the rapid adoption of this technology, there has to be a reason for that and there has to be benefits associated with that. And um, part of those benefits is obviously things that make robotic milking successful. And, and that's what I wanna do in this webinar today is talk about yeah, some of the some of the opportunities we have, but then also some of the challenges to those opportunities and some of the things that might actually limit us from being as successful maybe as we'd like with the use of uh, automated or, or robotic milking systems. When it comes to the benefits that are possible, um, there, there are a number of things that we, we have to consider when we think about uh, the potential benefits of adoption of robotic technology. And it, it's something that uh, our group, uh, our research group, as well as a variety of others have studied over the years. We did a survey study of Canadian producers uh, about seven or eight years ago already, looking at a fairly large uh, sample size of producers. It was about one third of the dairy farmers in Canada who were milking with robots at that time. And we asked them a series of questions, which we subsequently published in a series of papers around some of the benefits that they were observing and incurring, uh, as well as challenges with the adoption of robotic technology. And this is a, a short list, I would say, so to speak, of some of the things that uh, were probably most in common reported out of that study. And uh, these included greater milking frequency and yield, improved cow health and reproduction, uh, the potential for greater herd management, particularly with uh, greater information uh, collection, data collection and use of that information, less and or more flexible use of labor, um, particularly for our, our kind of small to medium size, more family run uh, farms where uh, the, the time uh, of the owner operator, so to speak, was a lot more flexible in, in terms of what they could do uh, in day in, day out and, and, and week in, week out. 
And then also uh, those producers uh, reported for the most part improved profitability and quality of life. And uh, when we asked producers specifically about those questions, we asked them on a scale of one to five, whether or not their profitability uh, improved as well as their quality of life. And this is the, the results that we got from that uh, survey where we asked them on that scale of one being strongly disagreed to five being strong agree, whether or not the adoption of robotic milking had improved their profitability, met their expectations, as well as improved their quality of life. And what you see uh, by these answers uh, on, a, on a, again, a scale of one to five, where these are the averages, you see that uh, for the most part, the producers reported these things all as being all very positive, including their profitability, and then particularly meeting their expectations and their quality of life. And a lot of what they expressed was um, improvements in their quality of life in terms of having their, again, their time being more flexible, uh, having uh, less kind of manual physical milking labor um, and, and, and actually benefits from a family perspective as well. What was probably one of the most interesting things that we got out of this uh, survey here as well was we also asked whether or not they believe that the quality of their lives, uh, the cow's lives had changed on their farms. And what you can see here is that the producers rated the change to the quality of their cow's lives just as highly as the uh, change to their own lives, suggesting that, again, this, this move towards automated robotic milking is not just something that they're doing for themselves, but also for the betterment of their uh, herds as well. And so that kind of then raises the question for us to think about then is, is what are those benefits for the cows? And, and what should the adoption of robotic milking do from, from a cow uh, perspective as well? And I've summarized it in, in kind of two main points. There's probably lots of other things that we could think about and, and, and probably list here, but the, probably the two biggest things that I think and that are tied together are the fact that when we milk with uh, robotic milking or automated milking systems, we're providing cows uh, more behavioral freedom. And, and, and as a result of that, uh, there's potential there for better health and production from those animals. Uh, when we think about what robotic milking is at its key, it's, it's voluntary milking and it's allowing the cow to uh, go milk when she wants to. Obviously, we would like to see that happen regularly. We'd like to happen that to happen on a regular interval. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're providing that cow that autonomy or agency, so to speak, to go do that on her own time schedule. And thus also then uh, match her other aspects of her time budget to that as well. And so giving that cow that opportunity to eat when she wants, to lie down when she wants, to drink when she wants, and then also uh, to milk when she wants. And uh, in, in doing so, we're not only potentially having a benefit from that individual cow's perspective, but then also from a herd perspective too, in terms of allowing those cows to, yeah, do those things when they want to, and, and also then use the uh, facilities that we provide them to do that within to the uh, uh, most uh, or the highest level of efficiency as well. Now, uh, again, we're seeing a lot of these things as our research demonstrated in, in some of that older work, uh, for the most part, producers are reporting that these benefits are actually being incurred. However, uh, just because uh, those are potentially occurring doesn't necessarily mean that they always do uh, actually occur. And, and I think it's important for us to realize that when we think about some of the uh, challenges and opportunities we have with uh, automated milking or robotic milking is that um, these these benefits, even though they can be there, they might not always be realized. And we we use some of the data actually from that study to actually uh, show this or, or demonstrate this. And in the case of that study, we did surveying producers about uh, changes in production and health. We asked them about how, say, their production changed, and including we asked them how their milk quality changed. And so we said, well, did your somatic cell count go up? Did it go down? Or did it maybe not change when you adopted robotic uh, milking. And, and we pretty well got responses in all those categories. Some producers said their somatic cell count went up, some said it went down, and some said that it did not change. And then we took those responses and actually compared that to the actual somatic cell count changes that we saw on those farms. And this is the data from uh, that um, uh, analysis that we did. 
and, and, and how we publish that. And at the end of the day, we had some producers who said that their somatic cell count increased. And when we looked at their actual change in somatic cell count, uh, yes, on average, their somatic cell count actually did increase. Some producers who said that it decreased, and again, the average was a small decrease in somatic cell count, and for a number of producers as well who said that their somatic cell count did not change, and again, on average, their somatic cell count did not change. When we look across all the farms that we surveyed, the average was basically zero, and the average farm did not change. However, um, these uh, individual graphs to show you that there is uh, obviously variation there. And probably the most interesting is that for those producers who went up, yes, almost all those producers who said they went up did go up. However, those that said they went down or did not change, uh, some of them fit right into that, but there was also a lot of variance around that. So some who said their somatic cell count decreased, their somatic cell count actually went up. And same thing for those that said it did not change some went up and some went down. Now, the reason I show this is because not just to say that, yeah, maybe producers weren't exactly aware of some of these changes that were actually happening on farm, but to highlight the fact that just because our expectation is that something might be, say, improving or, or maybe even not changing, doesn't necessarily mean that's always the case. And we always need to kind of evaluate why uh, those things might not be changing necessarily for the benefit as, as we might expect. And so that kind of leads me into the discussion for today's webinar is really to think about uh, success in robotic milking, but actually from the side of what are the things that are going to limit success in, in robotic milking? And, and the way I've coined that is what are the impediments to uh, what I would say is success in robotic milking, which is good health production and, and welfare of the cows on those farms. And again, just going to highlight uh, a number of different things that uh, we can consider um, using some existing data sets that we have uh, to support uh, these things. And I've really, I would have done is group that under kind of four different topic areas. Uh, first being situations where cows can't milk when they want to. Secondly, uh, situations where cows do not want to go milk. And so these first two points really kind of getting at that voluntary uh, milking nature that we, we expect and would like to see in, in a robotic milking scenario. And then the two last ones, which are more health and production related, uh, and specifically to utter health management and, and nutritional management on these farms. And what I'm gonna do is uh, collectively use a, a variety of different studies that we've been involved with, as well as others, uh, looking at these different things over the years, specifically focusing on a large study that we uh, completed just recently in Canada, where we surveyed about 200 farms. We actually uh, went on these farms and benchmarked all their production health data for a uh, year and a half period of time, and then have subsequently from that looked at uh, how um, uh, a lot of that production and, and health uh, variants that we see on these farms relates to um, management and, and housing and otherwise on these farms, as well as some other studies that we've done uh, leading up to this uh, time point that we are at here today. And so starting with this first point uh, where uh, cows may not will milk when they want to. And um, what I mean by that is, is situations where, yeah, cows may not be able to get to the robot when they want to or do so in a consistent manner. As I said before, one of the keys to robotic milking is having those cows voluntarily go and then also do so in a very consistent manner so that all those cows do get the opportunity to go at different time points of the day and we can maximize the number of milkings we get on those systems, we can maximize the efficiency of the use of that system at the same time as well. Now again, there's gonna be a lot of different things that probably influence that. Probably the biggest things that are going to influence that are the uh, design and, and management of the facilities we have, there's lots of different ways that we can design robotic milking facilities. Uh, we can take existing facilities and retrofit them and be very successful with that. We can build new facilities. We can set up robots within pens in different configurations, and we can discuss pros and cons of those in the question and answer period. Um, from my perspective, some of the, uh, at least from what we've seen from a publication standpoint, both in controlled studies and in 
observational studies is that some of the biggest um, kind of effects, so to speak, when it comes to uh, voluntary milking in, in barns with robots is the effect of uh, cow traffic, whether or not cows are uh, free to go to the robot, so to speak, whenever they would like to, or have to go through some kind of guided system um, whereby cows are, are going to the robot uh, either to or from the feed bunk typically and being selected to go into that robot through uh, some sort of selection gate. Um, as well as the stocking density of facilities at the robots, the free stalls, as well as the feed bunk. And, and those two probably, again, from the, the data that we have, uh, the studies that we've uh, published over the years have had the largest kind of impact on that voluntary nature that we see in those facilities. When we think about the uh, barn design and, and traffic system in, in, in those facilities, again, uh, lots of variation used in the industry, lots of successes um in in the industry both with free traffic with guided traffic systems however we tend to see a little bit difference probably in cow behavior between those types of systems and this is some data that we published uh last year in a study based on 75 farms that we uh studied in ontario canada of which um the vast majority of those were using free traffic uh, a smaller percentage less than 15 percent of those farms using guided traffic that fits pretty well with kind of the distribution that we see at the national level uh, when we look at the national population of, of robot farms here in Canada. What's interesting to note is within that study, as well as uh, some newer data that I'm, I'm not showing on the screen here, what we typically see is a higher milking frequency on those farms with free traffic, uh, typically coupled with, and I'll come back to this later in my presentation also, more feed bunk visits in those farms as well. And that's backed up by some older research that would suggest that we see more meals per day, more feed bunk meals in those cows on those free traffic scenarios. And in the case of this study, we actually saw an improvement in milk yield associated with greater frequency of uh, milking visits per day. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we can't get good milking visits and we can't get equivalent or, or high milk production from those guided system barns, but that's not necessarily what we see across the industry. And it probably takes a higher level of management to achieve uh, that similar uh, level of uh, production that we see in those, in those free traffic scenarios. Another area that uh, we've looked at in, in a variety of studies over the years is the stocking density of the cows in those facilities, particularly stocking density at the robot. Um, again, in our Canadian system, we don't tend to see uh the numbers of cows on a on a per robot unit be pushed too high uh in in some places uh people would suggest that we can push for 55 to 60 cows per robotic milking unit um for the most place uh i think a lot of people are comfortable kind of in that 50 to 6, 50 to 55 cow range as we get above that it becomes very uh much more kind of challenging so to speak to manage those cows well that we optimize not only in the number of milkings, but also the amount of milk that gets produced out of those robotic units per day. Um, what we do tend to see is that, um, again, even with lower averages than that, when we have ranges in those numbers of cows per robotic milking unit, every time we increase the amount of cows per unit, we see fewer milkings per day. And so if we're going to push higher numbers of cows per robotic unit, which we can do under certain circumstances, we need to make sure that everything else is managed very well in order that we don't lose, uh, for example, milking frequency and milking uh, yield on those cows in those scenarios. One kind of interesting uh, result that I think uh, warrants a, a little bit of discussion always is the fact that um, when we think about uh, space again on robot farms, uh, one kind of consistent result that we've seen in a couple studies is the fact that the amount of feeding space actually still matters on these farms. And I made the argument before that in a robotic scenario, we want cows milking voluntarily, we want them going to the feed bunk at different times of the day, doing so on their own schedule. However, um, even though we see maybe a little bit of uncoupling of this kind of synchronized behavior, it still doesn't mean that we can get away with say having less space, whether that's at the free stalls or even the feed bunk for those cows, uh, because those cows still do value uh, that space in order to maximize the uh, behavior that we expect from those animals in terms of spending 
uh, four to five hours per day eating at the feed bunk and being able to lie down for 11 or 12 hours or more per day. And, and the reality is that when we limit those things, we potentially change their uh, time budget, we change their eating behavior, their lying behavior, and as a result of that, we see production uh, effects on those things. And this is just one example of this big study we did of Canadian farms, almost 200 robot farms in Canada, where the mean amount of feed bunk space was about 64 centimeters or 25 inches per cow. So for, for most of us, I think we'd say that sounds like a lot of space for our lactating cows on average, but there was quite a bit of variation around that. The standard deviation was 21 centimeters on that 64. So that ranged from anywhere from uh, on average kind of uh, within kind of our standard deviation of about 40 centimeters up to 80 centimeters. And across that uh, range, every 10 centimeters was equivalent to about 0.3 kilograms difference in milk yield. So let's say if that was a 40 centimeter spread, that's a 1.2 kilogram difference in milk yield or about two and a half pound difference in milk yield that we're, we're seeing in these farms just based on the amount of bunk space available. And again, that's probably also dependent on other management on those farms, but just highlights the fact that Again, we need to make sure that environments are comfortable and that those cows can get to the resources that they want to in order to maximize their behavior, uh, optimize their behavior, and then maximize their production as well. The other uh, concern when it comes to kind of voluntary milking is situations where cows don't want to go milk. And so the facilities might limit that, uh, their ability to go milk. You also may have situations where cows in themselves might not want to go milk as well and and probably the biggest contributor to that is the mobility of those cows and and specifically when i when i say that it's situations where we have poor hoof health or uh high amounts of lameness in uh cows on our, our robot farms the reality is that a, a lame cow is is typically lame because she's got pain often in her hoof or somewhere in the leg or hips of that animal and that pain is then going to restrict her mobility and then uh, restrict her kind of desire to go milk voluntarily. And that's something that we see in our robotic herds. And the challenge that we have in our robotic herds is that we still see a significant amount of lameness in these herds. This again is, is some recent data that we published from uh, a study again last year uh, from 75 herds in Ontario, Canada where we scored a sample of her, uh, cows on those farms to estimate the prevalence of lameness on those farms, specifically clinical lameness, which on a, a gate scoring system of one to five, or one is sound and five is severely lame. We counted any cow that was a three or higher as being clinically lame. And then cows that were a score of four or five being uh, severely lame. Probably from a good news story, we have very little, uh, I would say, or low prevalence of severe lameness. Uh, nearly half the farms not having any severely lame cows. Some farms having still some challenges with uh, up to 10% or a little bit higher in terms of severe lameness. So obviously some, some work to do with those producers. But where we have a lot more concern is the fact that we still have a significant proportion of what we call these clinically lame cows. In the case of this study, over one quarter or 28 percent of uh, uh, on average uh, prevalence of clinical lameness. You can see here on the bottom this is those herds stretched out here looking at the individual herd uh, prevalence rates. Now again some farms with very low prevalence and, and doing very well but then on the other side here on the right side here we see that there are a, a fair number of farms that too have very high levels over 30 percent uh, clinical lameness on average. Now, the nice thing about that is it also, uh, again, allows us that variance allows us to identify what might be different. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a few moments in terms of what might be different between some of these herds in terms of what's um, associated with these higher prevalences of lameness on those farms. Now, the point I wanted to make, and, and I go back to some older data uh, to highlight that, it, this is the fact that these uh, high rates of lameness are particularly problematic on these robotic milking herds. And that's again, because when a cow is lame, she has some kind of pain that's gonna restrict her movement or make her less kind of desired or willing to wanna go uh, get up and go to that robotic unit as, as well as maybe go to the feed bunk at the same time. 
And so as a result of that, what we see in these robotic herds is a greater propensity for these uh, lame cows to uh, be fetched for milking. And this is from a study that we published already uh, six years ago, suggesting that those cows who were lame uh, were 2.2 times more likely to uh, have to be fetched for milking. And then as a result of that, what we saw in that same study is that as a result, those cows that were lame, and again, in, the, in this study as well, the vast majority, um, well over probably 95, 97% of these lame cows are actually what we call um, uh, moderately lame cows or clinically lame. So they're not like the cows that are kind of three-legged walking that are really easy to pick out. These are just cows that are walking with some kind of gait abnormality. Again, often as a result of some uh, small um, hoof pathology, whether it's infectious or non-infectious, causing some low level of pain in that animal that's restricting her um, uh, normal kind of walking behavior. And what we see in this case here is that even though these animals are only kind of, so to speak, having uh, very small kind of deviations in their walking behavior, uh, that's big enough to uh, cause a difference in milking behavior in these uh, farms where we saw those lame cows having about 0.3 less milkings per day. And as a result of that, uh, producing less milk. In, in the case of this study here, about a 1.6 kilogram difference in milk production between those uh, sound and lame cows. Likely, again, largely related to maybe the, the difference in milking uh, uh, frequency on those cows, but also even uh, maybe uh, lesser intake and, and, and other kind of behavioral restrictions that pain that that lameness causes in those animals. Now, jumping uh, also to our uh, more recent data, uh, we saw the same thing again, just kind of highlighting the importance of this. And I think it's it's important for us to consider this. In, in the case of our more recent study where we saw that average of 28% clinical lameness, the range was 10 to almost 67% uh, on, on, a, on a farm basis. And when we looked across that range, every five percentage point increase was associated with about one kilogram less milk per cow. And so basically, if we look across this range, let's say it's 55% for, for round kind of math, uh, we're looking at when we multiply that out, that's an 11-fold increase or an 11 kilogram difference or 24 pound difference in milk production that we could predict based on this model of kind of our herds with low clinical lameness versus those with high uh, clinical lameness. So that's a huge amount of milk that uh, potentially is, is being lost on these farms, just associated with poor mobility, uh, high uh, lameness on these cows. Now that begs the question then, uh, what can we do about that and, and what's contributing to the lameness on these robotic milking herds? And I'd like to say that there's some very specific kind of robot barn uh, design management features that are really contributing to this lameness that we've been able to identify. But the reality is in, in the number of studies we've done over the years, looking at risk factors for lameness on those robot herds, well, there are potentially some risk factors that might be kind of robot specific. The reality is that we're not necessarily identifying those. And what we have identified is mostly things related to the uh, factors which kind of uh, mostly affect the standing and lying behavior of the cows. And, and most of that, again, is the lying environment of the cows, the stalls, the free stalls, particularly the size of those stalls, the comfort of those stalls, things that are going to either limit the uh, desire of those cows to spend lots of time uh, lying down in those stalls or force them, vice versa, to be standing on hard, wet, concrete floors for longer periods of time than we would desire. And, and so uh, again, if I summarize the list, and, and this is a summarized list of, of factors we've associated with uh, lameness uh, across three studies over the years, and, and specifically in robot farms, uh, we saw less lameness, so lower prevalence of lameness in farms that had wider stalls, stalls with more lunch space, deep sand bedding so and, and lesser stocking density at those stalls. So all things that again are going to potentially affect how much time those cows are willing to spend lying down in those stalls, as well as um, the amount of bunk space on those farms again. And, and so again, when, when cows have sufficient amount of bunk space, they're able to eat when they want to satisfy that behavior that they need to. 
and that's going to limit them from having to stand around and wait for access to feed which then can cut into their line time which we also know that can have an impact in terms of their hoof health perspective as well and so again simple things maybe not always that simple but things that we know from some conventional systems translate here to our robot barns having a, a big impact on, on the hoof health and mobility of those cows on these farms. Switching gears a little bit, the, the next thing I want to touch on is, is the, uh, the impact potentially of, of udder health and udder health management on, on robot farms. Now, uh, initially, when uh, a lot of people started adopting robotic technology, even here in Canada, say 20 years ago, uh, we started to see, uh, or there was some concern that we would see an increase in the amount of um, mastitis cases and, and poor udder health in, in robot herds. And some of the concern at that time was with the technology and whether or not the robots themselves were um, contributing to that. The reality is, though, that um, uh, for the most part, some of those maybe inefficiencies that were there in the technology have really been worked out. And, and the reality is that um, we don't necessarily see uh, any kind of prolonged negative effects in terms of utter health in, in farms with robots. And when we actually look at the literature, when we look at uh, studies that have been done, uh, some researchers have documented say increases in clinical mastitis cow level and as well as herd level bulk tank somatic cell count in kind of a, a short transient period of time following the adoption of robotic milking on farms so sometimes anywhere from six months to to a year however uh there is no real sustained differences in these metrics when we look kind of beyond those time periods and so um, what that tells us is that the the utter health changes that we see and, and particularly these transient ones have little to do with the the robots and the milking procedure themselves um which in 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 theory actually can be a lot better from from uh, a consistency standpoint from uh even a, a milk out standpoint but rather uh some of these things are often related to some of the changes that particularly cows may incur uh, in housing and management related to stress uh, maybe changes in health on those cows as, as well as uh, changes in hygiene. And uh, once we can kind of make sure that we manage those things properly, then these concerns with um, udder health and milk quality uh, tend to go away. And, and so then the question is, um, does udder health and milk quality have to be a concern? And, and the answer is really not necessarily. However, doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't things that can be bottlenecks or uh, problems that can arise in, in, in these robotic milking uh, scenarios. And, and probably some just some things that we have to key in on because maybe things aren't uh, managed necessarily the same. When we think about the risk of infection in, in animals and, and other infection, for example, it's really kind of that balance between the, the, the ability of the animal to resist infection as well as the amount of kind of infectious pressure that are on those those animals and as long as we can keep those two things in balance then we don't necessarily see any issues from from a resistance standpoint again it's uh making sure that the animals are not stressed making sure that they're in good nutritional status so that they can again they have good transitions where they can mount good immune responses and then also making sure that we have good um uh teeth disinfection so that we're minimizing kind of that risk of uh, of bacterial uh growth and, and pressure so to speak and then from from the environment standpoint making sure that yeah we, we keep those cows as clean as possible uh, recognizing too that when a cow goes into a robot with a, a dirty udder like you might see in the picture here uh, that robot isn't going to differentiate that dirty udder from a cleaner one necessarily as maybe that udder would be in a milking parlor where the person who's um, uh, prepping that udder for uh, teeth cluster attachment is going to recognize that that udder requires a little extra cleaning before that unit goes on. In a robotic scenario, that's not necessarily gonna happen by the robot. And so there's even more impetus for us to make sure that those cows are clean. And so that probably also explains why we tend to see maybe sometimes higher uh, mastitis rates, uh, milk quality issues, maybe in older facilities, retrofitted facilities, um, because uh, of uh, sometimes smaller beds, smaller alleys, 
things that are going to potentially increase the amount of um, contamination that we see in those herds from, from a uh, hygiene perspective and, and as a result of that on the cows. Again, bedding management being very important there. Um, in our um, study from 2001, our, our large national survey study, we saw that again, and probably not surprising, the probably the one biggest thing that was protective of uh, utter health in robot barns was the use of sand bedding. And so probably not a surprise because we know that from a variety of other studies and conventional systems that sand is really the king from that perspective. Um, not only from a comfort perspective and, and maximizing lying duration in uh, free stalls, but at the same time also in terms of maintaining good utter health, as long as again that sand is kept well uh, maintained and is kept clean in itself also. Um, and then cow behavior patterns also influence these things as well. We know that again when cows stand up and lie down, if they're spending excess time standing in wet uh, dirty uh, alleyways, if they're having to wait too long for or milking, or vice versa, if they're lying down immediately after milking, often influenced by the design of this facility, maybe they also the feeding management of those cows, those things too then can influence that, that risk of uh, poor uh, hygiene on those cows, as well as increased risk of, of other health issues uh, in those scenarios also. One thing that I don't think we probably talk enough about is, is some of the opportunities that we also have when it comes to utter health management and, and robotic milking. Uh, uh, again, as I mentioned before, one of the benefits is the fact that we have quarter level milking. We have quarter level uh, uh, potential for quarter level takeoffs on cows. So again, our risk of maybe over milking uh, individual quarters on cows uh, is, is potentially decreased in, in robotic scenarios. Another uh, area where we probably can take a lot more advantage of is the fact that we can probably do a better job drying off cows in, in robotic scenarios. We know that from a utter health perspective as well as from a welfare perspective that getting cows milk production down prior to dry off is important to minimize the risk of utter engorgement in those early days post dry off. Uh, we also reduce the risk of early uh, dry period, uh, utter infection, mastitis events, as well as even carryover kind of effects into the next lactation. And one of the uh, challenges in a lot of our conventional uh, barns is to be able to do that efficiently through kind of uh, changes in diet or changes in milking frequency uh, in, in our, our parlor-based systems. Now with a robot, we're able to manipulate uh, feed to some degree by changing feed allowance in robots, which can also then change their desire to go to the robot, as well as milking permissions to get those cows down in terms of how often they go per day, and that can have an influence on their milk yield. And so this is just one example. I threw some data up here from a study that we published last year, kind of the first study to look at this from, uh, to our knowledge, uh, at looking at changing milking and feeding settings. So having, uh, in the case of this study, we either did not change basically the milking or feeding settings on those cows in the robot prior to in two weeks before dry off, or we uh, either reduce their milking uh, permission settings or their feeding allowance in the robot or both. And what you see in the in the both case here, which is the lower line here, was we saw a greater drop off in milk production or a reduction in milk production of those cows leading up to dry off to get those cows, in this case, down to a sub around 20 kilogram. Uh, some of the other research would suggest that we need to probably get down even to closer to 15 to really have a positive impact in terms of the utter health and the welfare of those cows um, in, the, in that early uh, post-dry period. However, this does provide us with at least some good data to suggest that we can do that with these robots with the permission settings. And in the case of the study, we didn't see any negative kind of implications of that or carryover effects into the next lactation. And so I think a lot of things that we can we can do from a positive standpoint with robots that way also. Now, the last thing I want to touch on here in, in my presentation uh, today is uh, another challenge, which could be improper nutritional management. And and again, uh, nutrition in in a robotic scenario is 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 a big topic and and something that we can't cover in full detail here today. Uh, but I want to touch on a few things because. 
Uh, nutrition is very important because we not only use nutrition in, in a robotic scenario, obviously to meet the nutritional needs and the production needs of the cow, but it also plays a critical role in terms of stimulating uh, voluntary milking in cows in, in a robotic scenario as well. And not just the feed that we provide in the robot, that's part of the equation, but we also know that the eating behavior of the cows at the feed bunk of the partial mixed ration that those cows consume also plays a big role in terms of the voluntary milking age cows. And I would like to use this data here from an older study of ours uh, from about 10 years ago, where we show here uh, the, for a group of cows over a number of days averaged out here uh, across a 24 hour period, the relative frequency distribution of the milking cows. What you see here is within day variation and when those milkings are occurring. And what's interesting to point out is that there seems to be some kind of peaks in milking activity in these cows. And the interesting thing is that those peaks in milking activity correspond to, in this case, these two arrows here where feed was delivered to those cows. And so we see a feeding uh, response in cows when we deliver fresh feed, for example. But in the case of this uh, study, we also see a milking response in those cows. And this was actually in a free traffic uh, facility you'd probably expect to see that to some degree in, in a guided facility, particularly at say a milk first uh, facility where yeah, the cows are, or even a, a feed first one where the cows are gonna go to the feed bunk upon the delivery of, of new feed. And so that might force some of those cows to then uh, go to the milking unit at the same time. And, and so um, what we see in, in the case of, of uh, this example here is yeah, you see that response to those cows where when there's a peak in eating activity, we also see a peak in milking activity. And we see some smaller peaks associated in this case with feed push-up as well. And uh, the point that I always like to make is that um, from an efficiency standpoint, and as we alluded to earlier in this presentation, if we wanna maximize the efficiency of the robotic milking unit, and we wanna kind of maximize or optimize the behavior of the cows, we want those cows not necessarily all to be doing all these things at the same time. We don't want them milking all at the same time. We don't really want them all eating at the same time. If we can get those cows to spread out their milking, do so on a consistently basis, we can spread out this line, so to speak, so that we get more consistency, more uh, evenly across a 24 hour period. And as a result of that, that has two benefits. Number one, we're gonna use the, the time better of those cows. We're gonna have less periods of time where cows are gonna have to spend standing waiting for access to the robot. There's some really neat new research suggesting that too, that cows can actually, even in robotic scenarios, spend hours per day actually waiting to be milked. Uh, there's some great work from University of Wisconsin showing that. And so again, part of that's gonna be dictated by when those cows actually do go milk. And then at the same time, if we can get those cows to spread out that milking activity more evenly across a 24 hour period across the herd, we're gonna also then optimize the use of that robot and actually be able to get more milkings, more milk and, and, and more efficient use out of that robotic unit itself. Now, the question is, well, how do we do that? And, and part of that's gonna be feed and, and feed quality uh, in terms of um, having very good digestible feeds that's gonna drive eating behavior in those cows. And then at the other side of it is making sure that, yeah, cows are stimulated to go to the feed bunk and when they do go there, that there's feed available for those cows. And, and that becomes even more important in a robotic scenario and is gonna have even a bigger impact on the time budget and, and milking cows. And I always make the point that it doesn't matter how we do that, whether we do that manually with a, uh, a human driven piece of equipment or an automated uh, robot technology, as long as it gets done consistently. Now, the reality is though that uh, in many of our, our situations, the automated technologies uh, pay for themselves in that scenario because they're able to do it more often and more consistent than we can through kind of manual physical labor. And we see then the benefits of that when it comes to uh, a research perspective. And this is some data that, again, we published in our, in our national study from a couple of years ago, where across 197 robot farms we studied, the average feed push-up frequency on those farms was over 12 times per day. Most of those herds, uh, closer to 70% of those farms using some kind of automated feed pusher. But even within that and across the uh, variation that we saw, every five extra feed pushes on those farms was associated with 0.35 kilos or 0.77 pounds more milk. And so again, 
by, by having that feed there, having it consistently pushed up across a 24 hour period, not just during the daytime when people might be in the barn, but even in those uh, late night, uh, early morning hours where there might be less people in the barn, we see that benefit of, of making sure that feed is available for those cows. We also see benefits of, of even getting fresh feed in front of cows more often in our robot facilities. This is some recent data as well from a similar data set. This is 120 robot farms from Canada where we looked at the uh, bulk tank fatty acid profile of those herds. In this case, the de novo fat, which is basically our, our, our um, uh, milk fat that's made in the udder of the cow, which really reflects a more healthy, consistent rumen environment. And what we see here is that those farms that are delivering feed more often, many of those using automated systems to do so, we see a higher proportion of de novo fat indicating yeah, a more consistent rumen environment and a more consistent uh, eating behavior pattern likely of those cows. Now, um, one last point that I wanna make and, and kind of conclude on is that um, we also have an opportunity with robots, which I think is great in terms of uh, probably doing a better job in terms of meeting individual cow uh, production needs and also at the same time being able to really push kind of production on our highest production cows and, and, and do so efficiently and doing that with the uh, supplementation of concentrate to those cows on the robot, which not only drives those cows to the robot, but also we can use that to drive production. Now, there are a lot of challenges with that. And, and I'm not gonna deny that, and we still have more research to do there, and, and, and we've been working on that, but um, we do have opportunities there. One area that we focus particularly on and, and spend a little bit of time thinking about is uh, some of the challenges that we have, potentially in early lactation on some of these cows. Uh, one of our studies from 2017, we highlighted that uh, on robot farms, and again, in Canada and in Ontario, Canada, we saw higher odds of having an increased milk BHB or um, uh, uh, as, as a measure of ketosis in those cows, where the risk for our multiparous cows was almost 1.5 times higher in those farms milking with a robot. What was interesting is at the time, we did not have kind of risk factors identified as part of that study. However, we were doing another study at the same time, uh, looking at the development of ketosis on robot farms where we interestingly saw that those cows that were diagnosed with subclinical ketosis based on a blood BHB test in the first two weeks of lactation, those cows that we diagnosed actually had higher milk production right out of the gate, as opposed to uh, those cows that um, were not diagnosed with uh, subclinical ketosis. Now, some might look at that and say, well, that proves the point that, yeah, maybe subclinical ketosis is just high production cows. And, and in some cases it is, but as long as those cows can maintain that production at a high level and not have any other clinical pathologies, that might be okay. But that's not necessarily what we saw in the case of this data set. In the case of this data set, these cows had higher production, but they actually lost that production uh, benefit here after about 10 days of milk and getting into about two weeks of milk. And so something was changing or happening in those cows. The other thing that we noticed is that those cows who uh, we did diagnose with ketosis, we're actually producing that higher level of milk in the first 10 days of lactation off basically the same amount of supplements. So the amount of milk they're produced uh, per kilogram of supplement consumed in the robot uh, was higher, which probably suggests to us that we weren't getting enough uh, nutrients or groceries into those cows right off the bat to meet their production demands. And so when we think about feeding those cows, particularly in early lactation, we need to make sure that we don't wait too long to get those cows onto a feed table that really we can get kind of their, their production needs uh, met through the amount of feed that those cows are consuming. We wanna make sure at the same time that those cows visit the robot enough so that we're maximizing milkings as well as the amount of feed that we're getting into them. And then finally also think about other ways of getting good energy into those cows too. And we're starting to scratch the surface on this a little bit. We've done one study a, a few years ago, focused on molasses supplementation. We just finished another one with glycerol supplementation. And think about other kind of gluconeogenic precursors that we can use in those early lactation cows to really maximize their energy intake without necessarily uh, increasing the risk of say rumen dysfunction in those animals. And then the last point I wanna make on this just before I wrap up here is the fact that we can't forget also that many early lactation problems 
often arise from the dry period or even before. And so the other thing that we need to do from a feeding management perspective in these robot herds is make sure that we manage feeding um, in, in the dry period, but even in the, in the previous lactation, in, in the second half of the lactation to minimize body condition gain and, and make sure that those cows are coming into the next lactation in a good body condition um, and ready to make a good transition onto their lactating uh, diet and production. So that gets me to the end of my presentation here. Um, very quick take home messages. Robotic milking presents a lot of opportunities. Um, we know uh, that there are some challenges, but we can optimize health and production and welfare of these cows when, again, we have uh, the time and space for cows to milk voluntarily. We maintain good comfort in these facilities, clean environments, and then make sure that we have continuous feed access and good nutritional management. And, and with all those things, we're able to optimize uh, those benefits that we see associated with robotic milking. So with that, I would like to thank uh, a variety of the people that uh, funded a lot of the research here that I described today. Thank you for their contributions. And I'd like to thank you for your attention here and happy to answer any questions. That so thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Dr. DeVries, for sharing that presentation and talking about some of the things that people can do to maximize the health production and just overall productivity of their cows in milking robotic systems. I also would like to thank Galaxy once again for their sponsorship of this particular webinar. If you want to see this webinar again or any of our past webinars, you can find them on our hordes.com webpage. This one will be posted later this week, but you can find all our archives there. Just go to our hordes.com page, check out the webinar tab, and then you can find um, all our webinars located in that spot. We have some webinars coming up the next couple of months. Um, if you want to go ahead one, there you go. Um, in June, we'll have a presentation by Lily Edwards Calloway from Colorado State University, and she'll be speaking to us about human and animal interactions. Then in July, we'll hear from Dr. Bill Weiss, a professor emeritus from The Ohio State University, and he'll be talking about vitamins in dairy cattle rations. So now we'll move on to the question and answer section of this webinar. We had a lot of really good questions come in. So I will start going through those, Dr. DeVries. You can move the slide ahead one more and we'll, we'll get started here. Um, the first question relates to ketosis. We'll start with that since you just spoke about that recently. Um, this producer says they're currently feeding glycol in their robot for the first 21 days in milk to prevent ketosis, would it be beneficial to feed that longer to high producing cows? Um, my, my gut is, we don't, I don't have any data to say yes or no on that question. Um, my gut would be say to say probably not necessarily. Um, again, I think in that first few weeks of, uh, of lactation, particularly as we, um, the rumen of the cow is a little bit more susceptible to acidosis at that time period as she transitions from a dry diet to a lactating diet. It's probably a little bit more important for us to get some um, more uh, um, uh, non-forage kind of fibers, carbohydrates in those animals to get energy into those animals, as well as other kind of gluconeogenic precursors like glycol. Um, and, and less starch, but as that cow gets beyond that kind of time period, we can probably meet the animal's uh, energy needs through a bit more uh, non fibro carbohydrates like starch kind of sources in the, in the diets of those animals. So we can push that through both the PMR as well as the feed that we uh, provide in the robot. So might not necessarily be needed to feed kind of those things uh, an extended period of time. Our, our biggest thing at that point is to making sure that that cow is getting enough nutrients in and again, that's that balance of feed that that cow needs to eat at the feed bunk. And so it goes back to really good digestible forages, making sure the cow has good eating behavior at the feed bunk. And then also making sure we don't wait too long to put that cow onto what we call a production-based feed table. And, and so again, those higher producing cows, they're gonna eat more. We can model that in our nutritional programs. And so we can say that, yeah, they're gonna eat so much PMR, but we can also program or, or model how much concentrate they need to eat in the robot too and base that on their on their production level as well and, and we can dial those cows in uh, through that kind of uh, means as well. Thank you for that advice. 
The next question now goes back toward the beginning of the presentation. You talked about the difference between guided flow and free flow systems, and so that guided flow can work very successfully, but it takes an extra level of management. Could you share maybe a few details about what that entails? Yeah, I think I think the the risk with the guided flow, I always say, is when management's not superior in a guided system, then it's often the cows that are at risk. And in a free traffic scenario, it's the producers. And, and what I mean by that is the producers, when things aren't managed perfectly in, in a or as very well, so to speak, in a in a free traffic scenario, then the cows just aren't going as much as they should. And the producers have to fetch a few more cows. Some producers will say that's fine. I don't mind doing that, right? In a guided scenario, because the cows are forced, so to speak, to go to that robot on their way to or from the feed bunk or to and from their lying stalls, there, there may be some cases where we see less fetching. However, we still may have some challenges where, yeah, those cows may not be going through enough that they're going to the feed bunk eight to 10 times per day and getting enough meals per day. And um, sometimes that's going to be driven by the feeding management of those cows. If, if the feed, kind of going back to what I was just saying, if, if we don't have really good quality feeds, we don't have good quality forages, that's going to promote really kind of good meal eating patterns in those cows. If we don't have good feed access, those kind of things, if those aren't really well done, then we see that risk of those cows not wanting to go to the feed bunk as often. We see less meals per day. If we have hoof health issues in cows, as I described too, that, that becomes even more compounded in those scenarios. Again, in a free traffic scenario, we see the same, but probably even more so in, in a guided scenario where that cow may not want to always get up and go um, to where she needs to go. And, and again, if she has to wait for any reason um, and, and queue up or, or be put into a holding pen where she has to wait and she's already got foot problems, those things are going to make it even more of a difficult experience for that cow. And so we need to do a better job kind of managing those things uh, in those scenarios as well. And like I said, in, in, I've been in facilities where all those things are managed very well and we see the exact same kind of outcomes that we do in, in the free uh, traffic scenarios. Um, but I think some of the challenges get kind of exponentially kind of increased in terms of the risk on the individual cows. Sure, thank you. The next question, you mentioned um, the data that show that 10 centimeters of extra bunk space translated to more milk production. Someone's wondering, does that max out at some point? Like what what would you consider the maximum yeah. amount of bunk space needed? Yeah. So, so yeah, you have to interpret those results. So that question is about, yeah, is there a maximum amount of space? And, and yeah, I would probably uh, we get to a certain level, it doesn't matter anymore. Those results have to be interpreted in terms of what we, right, we're looking at in terms of that that space, right? And so again, the, the majority of those herds in that study were between, like I said, about 40 to 80 centimeters of space per cow. Uh, that's um, like, yeah, 16 to 32 inches of, of space per cow uh, at, the, at the feed bunk. Um, a lot of the studies with transition cows and stuff like that would say that, yeah, if, if we're at that kind of 30 inches of bunk space, that's probably plenty. Am I saying we need that much space in a robot barn? Maybe not necessarily, but it does speak to the fact that um, these cows do still do benefit from having kind of sufficient access to resources. Um, uh, my goal would be to make sure again that, yeah, every farm with robots does have close to the two feet of bunk space. And, and because again, it's probably the greater risk is those people that are on the lower end of that, right? The, the, the three row barns that are even at 100% where we don't have that two feet of bunk space per cow or the three row barn that's slightly overcrowded at the stalls, we even have lesser amounts, right? We have sub kind of less than 18 inches of bunk space per cow. Probably the risk there is greater. I did mention this, but yeah, there, there could be some kind of interaction there also with feeding management, right? The better job we do with feeding management and as well as the quality of our feeds, the more distributed we can get the eating behavior of the cows, maybe that allows us to manage lesser amounts of bunk space better as well. Um, if 
we're feeding once a day and we can't push up feed very often and our forage quality is not very good, then yeah, we wanna get as much space for those cows as possible in order to maximize intake and, and, and really prevent any issues from occurring. If we've got very good quality forages, we've got very good bunk management, um, the cows are very mobile, then yeah, we might be able to manage less space. And, and, and again, we see that in some facilities, right? Um, those data though speak to kind of the, the aggregate or the average of what we see in the industry though. Sure. And a related question, what is your recommendation for stall stocking density in a robotic facility? Yeah. Yeah, again, it, and, 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 and I don't, um, I would say that our data is clear, like just like with conventional, we know that when we overcrowd stalls, when you go above one stall per cow, we see uh, lesser lying time on cows than, than what we would desire, and we see higher risks of, of lameness and other things. Now, when everything else is managed really well, the stalls are well designed, they're well bedded, well groomed the risk of overcrowding those stalls and the negative effects of that go down right so again there's always that kind of interplay between the the facility and, and the management of that facility uh, but the reality again in the in the robot facilities and and we've done a couple studies where even when the average stocking density was less than one cow per stall um, but we had a range around that. We saw more cows being needed to be fetched and we saw more lameness with, with higher stocking densities, particularly as we get above a hundred percent. And so again, I, I think the, the individual farm has to look at it from a, a overall management perspective too. Um, some farms can handle some overcrowding with very good management of everything else. Now, if, if we can't manage, like I said, the stalls themselves, if they're not comfortable, if we don't have good bedding management, if stalls aren't big enough, not enough lunch space, not wide enough, we don't have very good soft bedding for those cows or enough bedding on, under those cows, then the risk of overcrowding becomes even greater. The negative impact potentially of that becomes even greater. And so I always say it's kind of a relative thing to whatever else kind of is going on from a comfort perspective in, in those facilities. Another question ties in really great with that. Someone's wondering what stall width you recommend for best hoof health. Yeah, I guess still what we see in the industry is is that kind of 48 inch wide stall uh, is still probably adequate for a lot of, uh, of our cows um, or 120 centimeters. The, the reality is it needs to fit the cows, so to speak, right? Um, and, and so Again, if we've got a uh, purebred Holstein herd and they're big, what we say, Canadian genetic cows, then those cows probably need a little bit wider stall than if we're um, maybe have bred for a little bit smaller cows, or if we've got uh, crossbreeds or something else where they might be a little bit smaller framed animals, right? And so, um, again, really kind of interesting um, study we did back in 2016. One of the studies I cited in, in my webinar was a paper called with the last name Weston et al. It was based on robot farms in Canada and the US. And in that case, what we did was we actually measured the width of the cows on the farm. And then we said, if the stalls were at least one and a half times the hip width of the cows, um, did they fit, so to speak, or not? And when the cows were not fitting their stalls on average in those herds, we saw a much higher proportion of lameness in those farms. And, and so again, just speaks to the importance of, yeah, that that influences the lying behavior. If those stalls aren't wide enough, it's gonna influence the lying behavior of those cows and, and potentially influence uh, the lameness prevalence in those farms. And, and so I, again, I say, we have some averages out there within the industry, but then work within what, the, the size of the cows are on your herd as well. Okay, um, we have a question. Someone's wondering the, what is the investment in um, installing a robotic milking system? What is the cost per box? Obviously there's a variation in the industry, but do you wanna maybe give just a general, um, general what that investment might be um, in US dollars they're asking? Okay, yeah. Um, and again, uh, I'll give I'll give some 
general numbers, but again, uh, realizing that, yeah, the, the, the cost actually varies by market. Um, it's going to vary by manufacturer. It's going to vary by market. So uh, I know, for example, a robot in Canada costs different than what it does in the US and it costs different than what it does in, in Europe. Um, and, and then also I, and with anything I, and probably understandably is scale also matters there, right? And so if you're wanting to buy one or two robotic units, your your price per unit's going to be likely quite a bit different than uh, if you want to buy 10 uh, robotic milking units. Um, and so uh, that's my kind of biggest political answer. When we're looking at single box robots, uh, again, the, the price varies, but uh, yeah, w the, these are not, uh, uh, these are not pieces of equipment less than, let's say, $100,000 that we're able to to buy individually, right? So uh, the price point is is there or higher, uh, so to speak, or much higher. So um, uh, again, uh, I'd urge the person who's asking the question to to reach out to their to their local dealers, and they'll I'm sure they'll be happy to to discuss their individual needs and 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 quote them on on what uh, that might be for that for that individual farm. Thank you for that insight. Um, now we have more of a genetic question. What do you recommend for selection criteria for cows that are more adapted to robotic milking? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, very good question. I, I didn't put too much in my presentation today. We are kind of scratching the surface on that from a behavioral standpoint. Um, uh, we've long kind of looked at temperament of cows from a behavior standpoint uh, as it relates to say milking um, one thing that we haven't looked at uh, too much is is milking kind of behavior in robot facilities and we've just started to do some studies we've got a couple of studies published now where we're looking at how individual behavioral variation actually influences milking success and, and even training to milking in robots as well as kind of continued use and what we see is that yeah there are some cows based on their behavioral profile, and, and we talk about individual kind of consistency and behavior or personality of cows, so to speak. And so some cows that are um, uh, maybe more bold uh, tend to do better or adapt easier to robots than uh, cows that are less kind of bold or explorative. Um, sometimes cows that are overly active actually have more issues in robots. They, they tend to have more milking issues, more other uh, attachment issues than, than cows that are less active. So that's an area that we're looking into. I, I can't say that we can necessarily select for that right now, um, but general temperament of cows will tell us probably to some degree about that. So if we have some cows that just temperamentally are not very good, uh, those could potentially be animals that we don't necessarily want to kind of keep going from, from that perspective. Obviously, uh, good feet and legs, as I talked about the importance of mobility, making sure cows are, are strong on their feet, uh, that uh, they desire to walk, so to speak, and, and, and have good, uh, good hoof health are very important. So anything we can select for from that perspective. And then utter confirmation too, a lot of people have talked about it and thought about it in the past. Now, again, I'd say it's important, but also realize that the, the robots themselves have improved dramatically over the years in terms of kind of being able to find teats and, and um, they pretty well milk almost any shape of udder. Now, again, if we've got uh, teats that are very high on the back or, or crossed over or whatever, those can be a little bit more of a challenge. So if we have any udder confirmation issues, and, and those are things that obviously we want to try get out of those cows and 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 try to select for better confirmation but it's not always necessarily a deal breaker either okay so we we still have a lot of questions to go so i'm going to try to get to everybody's but just um some of these we might be lumping together a little bit so hopefully we still are getting to your answers um someone's wondering they said a lot of times you see data that shows that 3x milking herds are producing higher than robotic herds, despite all the advantages of robotic milking. I guess the most obvious response is that is the milking frequency, but are there other details that um, you know, that explain that production difference? Yeah, the, the biggest thing there is actually like the, probably one of the biggest things is actually the consistency in milking interval, right? So in a 3X herd on a parlor, 
for the most part, those cows are going to be milked pretty well on an eight hour milking interval, right? At every milking, it's eight hours later. What we have in a robot herd is that, yeah, the cow that milks 3x on average, she might milk every eight hours, but she also might milk, right? Nine hours, nine hours, and then, right? Um, uh, six hour or, or right and and so um, that variability in milking interval can then actually uh, have a kind of a depressive intake or, or impact sorry on on the milk yield of those cows and even other other things and then realize too that not every cow milks at that average either so even if we have a th average of 3x there's some cows that are milking four four times a day some that are milking two times a day um, some of that's for good reason. We would like our early production, early lactation cows to milk frequently. We get good mammary cell uh, proliferation in those cows and, and better peaks and persistency. Later lactation cows, we might not necessarily need them to be milking three times a day either. Uh, but regardless, we want to see that really consistency in milking interval to kind of match that 3x production. And I think in our herds where we see that, where we have very good consistent milkings in cows, Again, a lot of that's driven by uh, good quality feeds, feeding management, good mobility in cows. We see uh, the ability of, of those herds to match kind of 3x milk production. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what is your opinion on feeding more concentrates in the PMR instead of through the robot to avoid pH drops um, and maybe maintain more consistent room and function? Yeah, I think there's there, there's a lot of levels, so to speak. It's not an easy one. Um, I guess I'll say that going back in time, we used to feed probably feeds in the robot that were kind of sometimes put cows at risk for things like pH drops and, and rumen health issues because we were feeding uh, feeds in the robot where that were too high in starch that right were too readily fermentable. When we look at today, and, and again, we just finished a large feeding survey of, of, of uh, robot farms in Canada. When we look at the nutrient profile of the feeds that are fed in the robots, uh, for the most part, the, the nutrient kind of profile of those are not that dramatically different than what we see in the PMR. And, and, and so we're not feeding too high of starch, for example, that's gonna cause those, those rumen health issues. And so, Again, in those scenarios where we we're not feeding such a hot, so to speak, concentrate in the robot, we can get away with feeding those cows more, so to speak. I always make the point at the end of the day, the cow for a certain level of production, the cow needs to eat a certain level of dry matter. And it, to me, it doesn't matter where that comes from. Uh, they've got to get it from the feed bunk and they got to get it from the robot. Our opportunity with the robot is that, yeah, we can feed those highest production cows that little bit more to get them to eat a little bit more, as long as they're doing the same thing at the feed bunk. They, now, we can't feed them so much that then they eat less at the feed bunk because then at the end of the day, they don't necessarily eat more. And so some of that comes back to what individual cows are capable of, the, the models we have for predicting that. So based on the production of the cows, we can feed some cows too much because some cows just can't eat enough in the robot. And, and as a result of that, uh yeah they 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 leave feed in the robot they don't eat what's allocated to them and so having good predictions of what those cows are capable of eating um from a production standpoint uh goes into our feed tables and our and our dietary programs so um again uh can we push for more feed in 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 in, in the PMR definitely, particularly we do in our guided barns. Um, in our free barns, we can push it down a little bit, but then I realize at the same time that some of the benefit we have of actually getting more feed into certain cows is to actually get better production and more persistency out of those cows. And, and we do have that opportunity in, in those facilities as well. Okay, thank you. Um, what variables or which what data do you think is most useful in a robotic milking system to help identify mass potential mastitis cases or cows that have milk quality issues? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, again, I and and I'm not going to speak to specific um, brands, so to speak, but every every robot that's out there has different kind of systems in place for identifying, say, um, uh, potential cases, either well 
health issues or, or in, in this case, uh, mastitis cases or, or other health issues in those cows. And so um, often those uh, alerts are based on different things that are getting measured. So some robots incorporate actual uh, uh, somatic cell count uh, uh, of cows and, and looks for changes in somatic cell counts. Some are proxies of that based on, on, um, uh, on, on, on tests that are done on the milk. Um, color of milk, uh, temperature of milk, uh, the amount of milk, the uh, conductivity um, or uh, enzymes in milk, all these kind of things are things that different robots that are out there in the market are measuring and using in some kind of combination often to identify um, cows that, that have potentially other health issues. Um, all those systems can work um, and, and, and do seem to work. We've played a little bit of that from a research perspective. We've added into some of that in, in a study we did two years ago, actually adding in some milking behavior and rumination behavior of cows as well. A lot of the farms that are using robots are also adding different activity monitors on their cows, whether that's rumination or just general activity or, or pedometry systems. And what we found is that by adding in actually into a predictive model, both the behavior of the cows, um, as well as the various kind of milk measures that are taken, including the milk yield of those uh, cows, we're able to come up with a better kind of predictive model. And so the, these are things that I guess at the end of the day, the, the robots themselves will have uh, mastitis alerts or other health alerts built into them. And, and the companies are, uh, as far as I'm aware, are all continually working on improving those those alerts uh, um, with with new information that, that is and can be gathered in these systems. All right, great. We'll have one more question. I do want to point out if anyone is looking for a copy of the presentation slides, you can click on the handout section of the control panel and you should be able to click on a PDF link there and print that out. Our last question, this is more of a general, um, general question about how robots function. They want to know about the cleaning system, you know, how, how is all that equipment washed and when? If, um, if you maybe just give a few details about that. Yeah, and again, uh, and, and without getting too kind of specific on different uh, systems that are out there and brands, every, every system does it a little bit differently. And 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 again, most most would incorporate some kind of, in, in thinking of just washing of the system itself, most of the robots obviously are, would incorporate some kind of within day wash. Um, that can be changed in terms of the number of times that happens. And many people will still have their uh, robot go through uh, some kind of cyclic, cyclic wash uh, a few times a day uh, to make sure there's a full full wash of, of, of all the lines and everything in the system. Uh, again, between cows, uh, lines are flushed out, right, to do that um, and, and, and to, again, minimize any contamination between cows and, 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 um, uh, and, and yeah, any risk of, of um, uh, pathogen spread there as well. All right. Well, thank you for answering this great group of questions. Um, it's, you know, it's a pleasure to be able to hear your insight. And we know you have a lot of experience working with robotic milking systems. So thank you for sharing, um, sharing these answers to the questions that came in. Um, no once again, thank I'd like to thank Dr. Trevor DeVries for his presentation during this Horde Steerman webinar. And I'd also like to thank Galaxy for their support of this presentation. Um, also, I want to make sure and thank all of you in the audience. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us for these webinars, and we hope that you found it to be useful, that you'll be able to utilize this information either on your dairy or with the dairies that you work with. From our team here at Hordes Dairymen, I want to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Take care, everybody.